Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Welcome, podcast listeners. Today, we have a great show for you with a man Forbes recently named as the number one angel investor in the galaxy. They actually said the world, but I don't know any other angel investors on Mars. He's an investor in a lot of companies you would recognize, including one of our favorites and friends, Betterment, and has invested in 400 companies. He's not just an investor. He's also started up, sold three companies. He runs the startup studio and venture fund, FJ Labs, which we co-founded with a buddy of his. We're thrilled that he's joined us. Welcome, Fabrice Grinda. Thank you for having me. You are live from Punta Cana right now. We're really excited to have you on and chat. But before we get to all the serious stuff, I hear you're a fellow skier. So you got to let me know, what is your favorite ski destination in the world? I've been skiing, frankly, since I've learned how to walk. So since I'm three and I used to race, I fell in love with powder reasonably early in my life. And I've had the privilege heli skiing every winter in the Revelstoke area in British Columbia, the area around Kelowna, Revelstoke, Calgary, and definitely has the best deep, steep tree skiing in the world. And it's by far my favorite. As the locals call it, Revel Stuck, because a lot of times these big storms come in and you get stuck there. We went there a couple years ago and it was pretty awesome, pretty awesome trip with what people call the Powder Highway listeners, which is a bunch of destinations and cat skiing around there. Fabrice, have you been to ski the Empire of Japan yet? I have. I Hokkaido and so the Niseko area is absolutely extraordinary. It's probably the place where it snows the most in the world. The powder is extraordinary. That's said the mountain is not very high and the steep is not particularly and the slopes are not particularly steep even though it's an amazing place for to learn power skiing and there's also this really cool snowmobile up and ski down approach that they have which is an alternative to heli which i guess given that much it snows probably makes sense i find it somewhat less compelling than actually the revy area and the entire british columbia mountain range you get to have ramen for lunch so it's kind of a toss-up i love skiing in japan i grew up in colorado so a similar story what was your home mountain chamonix Tuata Valley, where where did you go? I know. So I'm actually from Nice in the southeast of France. So I was uh, skiing in the Southern Alps and Oron and Isola de Ville. Those were the home mountains. But of course, I would go to Chamonix, Le Trois Vallées, and Val d'Isère for the longer periods and for racing. To get back to Europe, the only place I'd skied was Anton. And that was like not even half as much skiing as it was drinking beer. Moosewort, that was the name of the bar. My God, I, that's that's a. <laughs> As a, that was a hard one to remember. I think half I, I the, think Europe does apre ski very well. Like, oh my <laughs> god! How, you had to ski. There was like halfway up the mountain. Half the people you walk out and they're like sleeping in the snow. You had to ski down afterwards. It was a mess. All right, listeners, we'll get into some actual investing topics. You have an interesting background. I want to spend most of the time kind of on what you're up to these days with your investing because your approach is a little different than a lot that we talk about. I think it's important to spend a few minutes on your background to help inform kind of what you're up to today. People, it's I think it helps shape your worldview of how you approach investing. So you started out as an entrepreneur. Maybe maybe walk us through kind of your path from undergrad as a as an econ guy, kind of starting companies and entrepreneur in the tech world. Grew up as always a nerd, and I got my first PC in 1984, a Compaq. I was I was 10 years old. It was like love at first sight. So I immediately started programming. I had a modem, so I started connecting BBSs. Ultimately, build a BBS. I went to Princeton knowing I wanted to be in the tech sector in some way, shape, or form. The word tech entrepreneur didn't really exist yet. I mean, Dell and maybe had been created then, and that was it. By kind of virtue of luck and timing, 
Princeton or started installing high speed internet connections in my in my sophomore year in ninety three. So all of a sudden we had a high speed connections to the ancestor of the web in the sense that we were using things like Gopher and Usenet. Mosaic wasn't out wasn't live yet. Mosaic came out and that was the very beginning of the web. And when Netscape went public in ninety five, it was obvious there was a bubble that was forming. So Yahoo came out, Amazon came out, and I actually was thinking through whether or not I should do something. But the thing is I graduated from Princeton and I was actually rather good student and finished up my class with all these different awards, but I was a socially awkward, shy tech nerd. I never really worked in teams. I wasn't very socially gifted. And I felt, you know, if I go and start something, I'm probably not going to succeed. I don't have any business expertise per se, even though I built a small startup in college to pay for college. And so I actually graduated from Princeton in 96 and decided I was going to join McKinsey and Company because it's kind of like business school, except they pay you. And McKinsey actually does a really good job at investing in its people and took like oral written communication classes, public speaking classes, and working in teams and clients was actually super helpful. But I went there as a means to an end. I went there knowing I wanted to be a tech entrepreneur. And I actually, I thought I was going to miss the bubble, but lo and behold, I didn't miss the bubble. And so in 98, I felt that I'd learned what I needed to learn. They promoted me, I guess, from analyst associate. I'm like, you know, time has come. I'm going to build a startup. Now, the issue is at that time, I was 23 and it was a lot harder to build startups than it is today. You didn't have AWS. You didn't have open source. You needed a lot more capital. A lot of things that I wanted to build, I mean, my first idea I wanted to build, like, because I've mostly been working in FIG or in the financial district, services industry an internet bank, you know, you needed like a banking license and capital and things that were probably too complicated and frankly too too capital intensive for a 23 year old. And same thing if you wanted to build an Amazon, too complicated. You need like supply chain management and inventories and logistics. And as an economist, you know, I'd always fallen in love with the idea of bringing liquidity and transparency to opaque and fragmented markets. That's when I, I saw eBay and I thought it was an amazing idea of like creating a marketplace for things that didn't necessarily have markets for the side of like your garage shell. And so I decided to build the equivalent of eBay in Europe and with my partner in Latin America. So I was 23, sold my apartment, quit McKinsey, moved back to France, raised uh, $63 million, I guess. At that time, it was, I mean, it was hard at first, then it became really easy. I mean, people were just throwing money at you if you had the right pedigree. And Princeton, McKinsey, and internet idea, money was flowing. And so grew that company to like five countries, 150 employees, like 10 million monthly sales, and buy it offer. We we're valued at insane prices, buy it offers insane prices. Ultimately, the bubble bursts and didn't do and didn't monetize for a variety of reasons I won't bore you with, neither the Latin American opportunity or the European one. I built a company in Latin America called Deremate or helped build it, which then became a company Libre many years later and it's publicly traded NASDAQ. And I, sure, that I failed, I thought long and hard, okay, what do I do next? Do I go back to business school? Do I go back, do I go to business school? Do I go back to McKinsey? Try to join a venture firm? And I'm like, you know, I didn't really become an entrepreneur because I want to make money. I built, became an entrepreneur because I like building something out of nothing. And frankly, I feel that I'm probably rather unemployable. I don't like having a boss. I don't like taking orders from people. I'd like to do what makes the most sense to me and maximizes my utility to be an entrepreneur. And so my main constraint and consideration then was, okay, I need to build, I want to be an entrepreneur. Now we are in a world where capital is no longer available. I need an idea that can be profitable and it doesn't really matter to me what that idea is. It, it just needs to be capital efficient and ideally profitable reasonably soon. I thought long and hard and decided to bring ringtones and mobile games games and wallpapers to the U.S. And, and that's an idea that had already worked in Europe and in Asia. The U.S. was in the dark ages when it came to mobile. Now, of course, it was really hard because I, I went to all the venture capitalists in 2001 and at the mere mention of B2C telecom, when every B2C company from eToys to, to Webvan to Pets.com had gone under, all the telco companies got under, I don't think I finished the sentence, they hung up. Invested every last penny I had, borrowed my credit cards, lived in New York, essentially uh, on $2 a day for like two years, like sleeping on the couch of the office, eating ramen noodles because I couldn't even afford coffee or, or traditional food. But little by little, I managed to grab victory from the jaws of defeat. I uh, ended up signing all the major cares, all the major labels, all the major publishers. And the company grew. I mean, I, I missed in the process payroll 27 times. At one point, we went from like 30 people to seven. I had to start coding again. I mean, it was rough. Revenues went from 1 million in 02 to 5 million in 03 to 50 million in 04 to 2 200 million in 05. I sold it to a publicly traded company in the same category for about 80 million, June of 2004, and stayed on a CEO for 18 months, and then went on to build the company I really wanted to build, which was basically, which has become since then the largest
just classified side of the world. So imagine what Craigslist should be. A mobile first, beautiful, spam free, murder free, prostitution free, personals free version of a classified site that focuses on helping especially women who are the primary decision makers in all household decisions to buy and sell goods, to find, to hire a babysitter, to, to buy a car, to buy an apartment, et cetera. And so that company, OLX, I launched with my business partner, with business partner with whom I tried to help build the eBay of Latin America, who is also a partner with my today's partner back in 2006. And we launched in a hundred countries in 50 languages or so. And it really took off in four countries in Brazil, India, Portugal, and Pakistan. So that we focused on these four countries, became really big, and then started little by little expand again. And today, OLX is 350 million unique users a month, about 3,000 employees, very profitable in the countries which we dominate from Russia to Ukraine to Brazil to the UAE, and also the leader in Pakistan, India, all of Africa, all of LATAM and Southeast Asia. So very large company, which I sold in a rather complicated deal over a number of years to a publicly traded South African media company called Nasrus. Did the first transaction with them in 2010 and stayed on as a CEO until I exited in 2013. What's interesting is by virtue of being a consumer facing internet CEO, other entrepreneurs would approach me and ask for money and advice. And after I started having money, I started investing in startups. Now, because I didn't have time, I, being a full-time CEO uh, as a day job, I'd be like, you know, I, I needed only invest in things I understood. So I decided, you know what, I'm only going to invest in marketplaces. I'm going to create a set of theses and a set of heuristics that allow me to make my investment decisions in one hour, basically. And so by 2013, with the other partner from the, the first company, started co-investing in a whole bunch of startups. So by 2013, I was already an investor in about 100 startups. When I finished OLX and I decided what to do next, I'm like, you know what? I've realized my partner and I both like building companies and we both like investing in companies. And so we created what ultimately became FJ Labs, which is this hybrid venture fund and startup studio that I'm currently running. The way that I came across you, Fabrice, was that started dabbling in private markets in about 2013, 2014 mainly as a way, my, my background was as fundamental equity analyst, all quant now. This is kind of a hole in my skill set. And so I said, I wanted to become educated about this world. And the only way to, in my mind, to really do a lot is to put real money behind it. And so I started investing in a lot of private companies. And I kept seeing FJ Labs, either as a current shareholder or participating in a round. And I said, oh, funny thing that it stuck in my head is because I owned at the time kind of a vintage truck, which was a 1960s Toyota Land Cruiser, which was FJ. 40. And so that it stuck in my head. I said, I, what, what is this? This guy love old Land Cruisers? Where'd he get the FJ? And it turns out, of course, that's, I think, y'all's initials. Is that right? Fabrice and my partner is Jose, so that's FJ Labs. And so I kept seeing your name and I said, okay, who is this? And then eventually it had read some more literature and, and kind of became more familiar with what y'all do and said, let's have him on the podcast and chat. You have made this transition to being an investor. You, I think you briefly mentioned this, but you also continue to create companies internally as well. Can, can you expand on that? You're purely passive investor. Tell us the general framework. By the standards of most investors, I'm probably a little bit crazy, if not probably a lot crazy. So every year I invest in about 75 new startups. We see every week about 100 startups that come in a third through directly to us because we're known as investors. A third are introduced to us by other VCs because they want our perspective on deals. And well, frankly, we don't compete with VCs, right? Most VCs, they, they lead, they do due diligence, et cetera. We don't lead. We don't price. We don't take board seats. We essentially do no due diligence. And I'll talk about that shortly Two one hour meetings. So at, le- at most a week, we decide whether we invest or not. And so because we're writing small checks, you know, if you're a lead VC in a series A and you're writing a six or seven million dollar check, we'll write a 750k check. If you're, their company's raising 20 million, maybe we'll write a one or two million dollar check. We're the friendly value added investor for the startups and for the VCs with really deep domain expertise in one business model, which is marketplaces. And where we, we can really think through through, you know, how do you build liquidity on the supply side, the demand side? What is the proper business model? Should you take a rake or a listing fee? Should you take another buyer or the seller? What's the scale of that rake? And so because we have this deep domain expertise, and that's where we are specific, we're actually reasonably generous in the rest. The, the other third of the companies we get every week, mostly coming from the entrepreneurs we back. So to date, we've invested in 400 startups. So that's about a thousand entrepreneurs. And they, they come back for the next company. They send us their friends. They send us their employees. You know, so basically the way it works. So every week we get about 100 companies. 
we will talk to 40 because 60 are out of scope. They're like, you know, whatever. They're great, but they're like satellite tech or or hardware or agricultural tech or biotech. So 40, we take a, a one hour call. We have the standardized reporting on this call where we evaluate the company based on, uh, first of all, does it meet our underlying theses? And number two, does it meet your heuristics in terms of quality of the team, valuation and business? And our evaluation of the business has nine business selection criteria, which includes total addressable market size and business model. But one of the most important one of, of those for us is unit economics. And we really want that. And by the way, the company may not be live, so it might be theoretical unit, unit economics, but we want the company to recoup their customer acquisition costs on a unit level within the first six months and maybe to get 3x net contribution margin per transaction over the first 18 months relative to their customer acquisition costs and the LTV to be as high as possible. And again, they, maybe the company is not there, but they need to have a story to explain to us how they're going to get there. And in fact, or evaluation of how well they understand their, their economics is a key evaluation process for us of how well they understand their business. And so we drilled fairly deeply on that in the one hour basis that the team makes a recommendation. We have a weekly investment call every Tuesday from 10 to noon. We, we review the 40 companies and then either we pass, we pass for now, or I take a call or frankly, we invest directly. And on average, we've been investing in 1.5 companies a week. So to date, we've invested in 400 startups, 70% in the US, 20% in Western Europe and the Nordics, 10% in Brazil and India, 65% seed and pre-seed, so pretty early in their life, about 25% Series A and Series B, and 10% in the later stages. Check sizes have been varying. The average check size is about 500K. Understanding that pre-seed, which is basically an idea in a PowerPoint or maybe less sub 50K revenue per month, we're investing 225K. Seed, we're investing like 450K. A, we're investing 750 to one. And then afterwards, we're one to two or one to three. To date, we've deployed 140 million, of which 90 million has been my partner in my, in my capital. So it's been mostly personal capital. So we're very different, again, from that perspective, that most of the capital has been personal. And we've done rather well. We've had 150 exits, realized exits on the 400 investments. And on these 150 exits, we've had a realized IRR of 70%. Realized, you know, most VCs talk to you about like, oh, the implied value of my portfolio based on the last round valuation is blah, blah, blah. But, you know, a lot of that is going to go to zero. So I'm talking only on the stuff that we've actually realized cash on cash and with about an average 6x multiple. So that's one of the two legs of the businesses, uh, the business we do every year. And then for fun every year, we build one or two new startups de novo. My partner and I have realized we love building startups. We love helping build startups. So since 2013, we've built about 10. And the way it works is we go to five business schools first year and we tell people we have this apprenticeship and future EIR program if they want to join. And every year on average, about 225 students have been applying from the first year of Harvard, MIT, Columbia, Warden, and Sanford. We hire three to four of those. They join us full-time during the summer, during which we make them work part-time in one of the early stage portfolio companies, part-time in, in venture. We teach them venture. During the second year of business school, they become, they work 10, 20 hours a week for us as venture investors, filtering inbound deal. And then when they graduate, the idea is that they become entrepreneurs and residents and they start looking to for ideas to build with us. And the business model there is a little bit different. We give them $750,000 in exchange for 35% of the company for us, 65% for them. But we join as active participants. My partner and I become executive executive chairman and we do whatever needs to be done, whether it's helping raise money or our recruiting or frankly, even sometimes playing an operating role. Sometimes I'm CEO, sometimes I'm chairman, sometimes I'm something else. So it kind of varies. We do that for a year until the company raises a series A. We do the next one the, the next year. And that we've done a number of companies. We've built a company called uh, Adormi, which is a lingerie e-commerce company doing about 100 million in revenues. We built uh, Viajadet in Brazil, which is a OTA doing 600 million revenues and profitable. We built uh, Rebag, which is a handbag marketplace doing like 30 million in revenues and doing rather well. We're building a blue collar job site in New York called Merlin. We're building a big real estate marketplace in Canada called Properly and, and frankly, a number of others, including a number of failures, including a number of actually rather public failures like BP. BP, Fabrice, this was, I used BP to sell a car a couple years ago. This is one of the more surprising startups that I was like, this was so pleasant and seamless. The entire 
yep. car buying and selling experience is so miserable. You'll probably find it Twitter timeline somewhere. I was like, what a wonderful app and company. I kind of saw that it didn't work out or maybe they got acquired or something, but that, that was a surprise to me. One of our thesis is reinventing marketplaces where buyer and seller need to do a, lo- a lot of work with a much more delightful user experience. And so creating these managed marketplaces where the buyer or the seller doesn't need to talk to each other and the, and the marketplace actually does a lot of the work. And BP fell straight into that type of thesis. We had done really well in the first three cities and they, it was a rather competitive uh, industry with Shift and Carvana. I guess the, the founders felt that it was, a, it was a land grab and we had to spend and expand as fast as possible. And basically the company probably spent too much money and expanded too fast to too many geographies. One of the approaches I really recommend to all the entrepreneurs is really nail it before you scale it. Like get your unit economics right, prove underlying unit profitability in the core geography before you spend, you expand to other geographies, especially if you're in a hyper local marketplace where liquidity and critical mass value of sellers matter, because otherwise the only thing you're doing is expanding your losses and your burn. I think that's a lesson that we didn't take to heart in that startup. And we expanded too fast, burned too much capital. And so it was rather difficult ultimately in, in a rather competitive environment to, to continue raising. And that sadly, it was a, it was a write-off, but I actually love the company. I love the approach. I think we were like essentially a hundred percent five-star reviews on Yelp. The NPS was really high and we'd actually really fix a broken user experience, but couldn't make it work from more from a financial perspective and made a number of mistakes along the way. Even some of the ones that you love don't work out. So I've heard you talk and you've you've interlaced it throughout this thread a bit about expanding and geography and you're just talking about BP. And I've heard you mention, I mean, a number of these companies already pretty global. Talk to me a little bit about your interest in investing the majority in the US, because I know at one time, you guys were pretty heavy in some developing countries like Brazil, Russia, and Turkey. And on the flip side, we had Jason Calcanus on the podcast, and he said, no, 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 you got to be located in Silicon Valley. Tell me a little bit about the way you think about geography as kind of a, a nomad citizen of the world. If you have a choice, I think build a U.S. company, cater to U.S. customers, don't go global. It's not worth it, right? Like the U.S. has 340 million rich consumers who are early adopters, and, and it's an amazing market. And if you're at 100 million in the U.S. in revenues, it's easier to go from 100 million to 200 million in the U.S. than it is to go from zero to 100 anywhere else. If you're at a billion, it's still true. Most likely, if you're at 10 billion, it's still true. So my core recommendation for most companies is do not go global. So if you win in the US, you're going to be worth so much more just from a valuation perspective. You can actually buy the foreign companies. And by the way, it's exhausting to be international. It's exhausting to be traveling and it'll decrease your probability of winning in the US, right? If Uber could take a step back and not have actually gone to all these markets and just made sure they won 100% of the US, I think they would take that trade off actually almost every day of the week. Now that said, there are a few exceptions to the world. My comment really applies if you your business requires like payments, inventory, uh, supply chain management, et cetera. If, if you're in a user-generated content business, your Wikipedia or your Facebook, then by by all means, go global, right? Like you don't actually need local operations or local offices. It's really easy. It may be a winner-take-all business in that category. But for most other businesses, my recommendation is just do the US. Now, that said, there have been opportunities for arbitrage where other countries are doing rather well and you can invest in great companies there and often it's less competitive and valuations are low and you can have exits. Now, the issue with these markets is you face market risk. Often when I've been investing internationally, and frankly, I've been investing in ideas that were reasonably proven because they'd been done elsewhere and then invested there. But that's not the core of what I do. The core of what I do is like business model reinvention and innovation in the US and invent, reinventing US business models. And that's the most interesting part. That said, I take into consideration, I'm, I'm an economist at heart, so I look at the global macro environment. And so in 2010, Brazil was doing well, Russia was doing well, Turkey was doing well. So I was long all, all these countries and you may remember there's a cover of the economist with like brazil is taking off and you had like the rio de janeiro statue like as rocket ship going up at that point about 50 percent of our investments were in these three countries all three of these countries made political choices and so they were political choices originally that i felt were going to have negative macro consequences i mean it's somewhat different in each country like they elected erdogan as president in turkey vladimir putin decided to i guess first invade georgia then invade crimea 
Crimea and then create troubles in, in Ukraine. They elected Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, who started passing non-business friendly laws and, and increasing the cost of operating there and capital controls, et cetera. And so I felt that these decisions and were going to have negative macro consequences, which were ultimately going to have negative micro consequences in our world. So I basically shut down all of our investments in all three countries. And we went from 50% of the portfolio of the new investments there to zero, which proved to have to be a precise call, especially the timing between investment and exit is about five years. And so you you want to be somewhat of a contrarian, but you don't want to be investing in near the peak. And I felt that we were, things looked too good relative to the direction that we were heading. It was able to sell off and, and avoid most of the disasters that happened in all these in all these countries. And frankly, as I said, I, I, I'd be happy to just invest in the US. It's still the place that most interesting innovation, company skill, the fastest. I mean, China is probably the other ecosystem that's just as robust, but it's not a level playing field. Obviously, I prefer to be in a place where it is a level playing field, and it's really the people that are the hardest working and the luckiest and the best who win, and not the people that are the most best connected. You mentioned your preference for marketplaces, and is that something that's majority driven by just your skill set, or is it actually a macro opportunity that you think is under served or is ripe for more business models? Why in particular do you guys focus in uh, that world? I came to love marketplaces because as an economist, as I said, I like bringing liquidity and transparency to opaque and fragmented markets, of which there are many. A few years ago, there was this famous slide that came out of all the sites that were attacking Craigslist category by category. Many people were investing in that. And many VCs assume, oh, this is done. You know, like marketplaces are done. The reality is much of the world has not been digitalized yet. And the tech revolution has really not reached most of the business sectors or industries. It hasn't reached the public the public sector. And I find that marketplaces are the most scalable and interesting way to actually build businesses with in a capital efficient way in every single category. And so right now, when we look at the B2B world, where many of the transactions are done the old fashioned way through Rolodex and connections and Excel or email, they're just not efficient. And so all of the efficiency that has happened in the consumer facing world has not yet happened in the B2B world. So we've been investing a lot in B2B marketplaces. We're in Node, a like petrochemicals marketplace. We're in RigUp, which is an oil services contractor marketplace, where if you're an oil services firm and you want to employ a welder, there are marketplaces where you can find that that person for a few weeks and they're doing hundreds of millions of sales and categories or industries were in a dump truck marketplace uh, called Tread that in the dump truck market, people don't realize it's 37 billion a year market and, and things have been done rather inefficiently. And all these categories, which are much larger than people suspect, are ripe for innovation. And I find that marketplaces are actually by far the most efficient way to go after them. And so yeah, where many people think we're both at the, you know, that everything that used to be done has been done or invented and that marketplaces are done. And I actually think that's far from true. And like, I think we're still at the very beginning of the, first, of the tech revolution as uh, Jeff Bezos wrote in his first letter to shareholders, and as he keeps republishing and rewriting every year back from 1997, we are day one. I mean, we're maybe at the bottom of the first inning. We're, we're at the very, very beginning of the tech revolution. One of the unique properties of what you do, Fabrice, is when people probably heard the intro and they heard you say, we invest in 400 companies, they probably drop their jaw and say, someone who wanted to be disparaging or derogatory would say, you know, that's the, the spray and pray method. You're just investing as many things as possible. But maybe talk a little bit about how that could actually be a complement with some of the properties of investing in, in companies and, and why your approach is to invest in so many companies versus concentrating in just, just a handful. I would argue we don't do spray and pray, given that every week we get 100 companies, we're investing 1.5, right? So every year we're, we're seeing 5,000 plus companies and we're making 75 investments. It actually is a pretty strong filter, especially since it's in a given vertical. I actually don't have a portfolio construction theory where I'm trying to I, create the ideal portfolio with a set number of companies I want to invest in or a set number of capital that I want to deploy. Now, in light of the strategy that I've defined, which is I want to mostly do seed and pre-seed, I don't want to lead, I don't want to price, I want to take board seats, there is a maximum amount of capital I can deploy before which I would probably start competing with VCs, which is the last thing I want to do because I want to be their partner. I want to bring them deals, et cetera. So I would argue we're not spraying and praying because we're actually rather rather specific or rather selective in the deals that we do, um, especially even if it's on one business model. But that said, there is a lot of value in diversification. If you think of 
of traditional public market returns, they follow a normal Gaussian distribution curve and everything falls within the whatever, one standard deviation of the mean, basically. In private markets, especially the venture markets, actually things have a tendency to follow a power law. So the top few deals actually account for most of the returns. So if you look at the US in the last uh, two decades, You've had four super unicorns, companies worth over $100 billion, right? You have Facebook, probably Airbnb and Uber in this decade, the decade before you had like Facebook, Google, the decade before you had like maybe Cisco, Oracle, and Microsoft, you know, so, and Intel. So it's like two a decade, basically, maybe three a decade. And, and same thing in China, by the way, in the last two decades. Then you have maybe 20 companies that are worth like 10 billion, 100 billion, and then like 100 companies that end up being worth over 100 billion, over 1 billion. And when you look at all of the venture deals, right? Every Every year, there's about 5,000 seed-funded startups with 500K or more. When you look at the outcomes, really over the course of a decade, 50,000 seed-funded startups, it's actually the top 100 per decade or 120 per decade that account for 99% of the returns. The top two account for 40% of the returns. The top 22 account for 80% of the returns. Really want to be in those companies. And there is a real value in diversification to guarantee the probability of being in those. So Kaufman did a study of how many, what's the ideal portfolio size uh, for an angel investor? And the funny thing is the more companies you're investors, an investor in, the higher your IR, unless you got really lucky. And so for most people, there's actually really real, real value in diversification. All that said, we're probably rather different than most because what I just described kind of suggests you want to try to play Powerball. You're trying to be in that 1,000 x or you're trying to be in the next Facebook or, or Uber. I actually am I'm investing with a belief that I'm not going to be in that because I chose to be in New York, and we can talk about in a few seconds, that I'm not going to see these deals. By virtue of investing in these companies that have valid business models, that have great unit economics, uh, and also by not being on the board, by not leading, I actually get a lot of exits, right? It's very rare an angel investor or VC has 150 exits that are realized. And the reason is we're probably doing the anti-VC strategy. Most VCs, if you talk to them, they'll tell you, concentrate your bets and find the winners and then double down on the winners. We've actually been selling our winners. So our traditional path of ownership is we invest in the seed and we'll sell maybe in the C route. There's no negative signal of selling because we own like less than 5% of the companies. And often we do it as a favor, like the company becomes really, really hot and like whatever, Greylock, Sequoia and Andreessen all want to invest. They all have 15 minimum ownership requirements. That's 45% dilution. The interpreter is like, look, I love all you guys. I want you guys and I definitely don't want you to find anywhere else. I don't want that much dilution. Go buy some early investors. If we find that the valuation is richer than we think the business dictates, we will sell 50 to 70% of our stake in the upper end. And that has allowed us to both have great returns and get reasonably early liquidity and much earlier than traditional VCs. And so it makes sense in our case uh, to have this reasonably diverse portfolio with valid unit economics where we're selling the upside. And, and I would argue that we are not at all spraying and praying. Traditionally selling to venture capitalists who are then buying the stake in the C round or are you using companies like Equity Zen? What, what's the route to liquidity? You know, we're mostly selling to the VCs when there's rent. So in the, in the private markets, companies are not sold, they're bought. Either an acquirer comes in and wants to buy the company or we go public. There's a, a new round that happens. And as I said, it's typically around the Series C that things become hot because right now all the VCs that used to be at the Series A and B have raised funds that are so large, that are multi-billion dollar funds, they want to write bigger checks. And there are not that many companies that get to a point where they can accept $50 million rounds, where there's so many people trying to write $50 million checks that valuations have gone reasonably high. And so and vision fund, of course, is creating inflation in the later stages. And so in fact, because everyone else is going late stage, I'm going earlier stage. So I'm, I've actually moved from uh, seed to now encompass pre-seed, which is not something we did in the past. The main way we sell is to other VCs in when a round is structured. So there'll be a round and the, pri the primary price will be whatever, 100 million, and they'll buy secondary at a 10 or 20% discount. Occasionally, We've transacted on Equidate, and we've, I think we've also used the Equity Zen and Shares Post, but there we've been more a buyer than a seller. We haven't sold much stuff there. We, we've mostly bought shares in companies that we were interested in that we didn't have exposure to. That said, the main reason for that, by the way, is 
a lot of the companies that we're selling, they're not big enough that they would be on an Equidate or a Shares Post or Equities end. I mean, the things that trade there are really quasi-public companies. It's like Airbnb and Uber, companies that are really big, that are really reasonably well-known, that, that have high market caps. Companies we would be typically selling, they're at like an 80 million valuation or 100 million valuation, 200 million valuation. They are not on these platforms. And we can only sell them to informed buyers who actually have done a lot of due diligence, decide they want more exposure, they want exposure to the category. And again, we don't typically sell 100%. We sell like 50 or 70%. Talk, talk to me a little bit about, and by the way, we just we just had the founder of Equities in on a prior podcast, and we had to bleep out like half the episode because I was naming all these companies. And he's like, Mab, you can't be naming these because these are active, <laughs> these are active offerings. So we're gonna have to bleep out all the names. Tell me a little bit about lessons learned. So you've been doing this actively as a angel style investor, 400 companies. You've probably have a lot of successes, but also a lot of scars or disappointments or takeaways as you look back over the past five, six years. What are some of the things that you've incorporated into your methodology uh, as the years go on where you say, you know, look, this is process we implemented because of XYZ or, hey, we've decided that we prefer founders over ideas or vice versa? Number one, if you're going to be investing in this asset class, be diversified. I mean, a few years ago, I, I created this angelist co-investment vehicle, which we would do on a deal by deal basis. And we're like, you know, of the whatever 75 deals we do a year, there's some where we have enough availability for friends and family to invest with us. The thing is, you know, people like my dad don't turn around very quickly. And so at the end of the year, so they miss most of the opportunities. At the end of the year, they'd have done two investments. So you know, three years later, then at five, we would be at like 225. And then you would lose money in every single deal and tell me, Fabrice, you suck, you don't know what you're doing. And I'm like, okay, this doesn't work. You, you should not, you as a private investor without actually the ability to make, to evaluate these deals should not be investing, frankly, in the asset class on a deal by deal basis. You should be investing in the fund and you should get exposure to the entire portfolio because you need diversification. If you if you have less than 20 or 30 or 40 investments, you're probably going to lose money as an investor. So we ended up not doing, for the most part, deal by deal angel syndicates. Instead, we created like a co-investment vehicle where people can invest with us. And it's kind of pretty pursue when we invest 100K, the fund puts 100K, but it's not really a, it's not a fund. There's a really capital up front and there's one every nine months or so. Where is that located? Is that on a platform? You guys just do it on your own? It's on AngelList. Okay. And we do one of these. You need to be an accredited investor. There's a 99 investor limits or whatever. We have 99 investors we stop and whatever we run out of money we do the next fund. So there's no real, I mean, we have a traditional venture fund, which is the equivalent of $200 million fund, which would be your second traditional institutional fund. But there are minimum investments are like 5 million. That's different. We're rather different, I guess, from most VCs because a big chunk of the capital is our own capital rather than third party institutional money. In fact, we have no institutions. We only have family offices and strategics investing with us. Second big learning, I've learned to stick to my guns. Like I want the team, the business, and the valuation to all be within our expectations for us to invest. So I used to have these coup de coeur where I'd fall in love with an entrepreneur and I said, you know what, the entrepreneur trumps all my concerns of the business or the valuation are irrelevant. They're so amazing, they're going to figure it out. More often than not, I ended up losing money when I did that. And I've realized I want all three. In fact, I want all four things to be true. I want the idea to meet my my thesis, which is my perspective on the direction the world is heading in to invest along to create that world of tomorrow and that better world of tomorrow. Two, I want to love the entrepreneur. Three, I want to love business. And four, I think the deal terms need to be reasonable. And all four of these things need to be true. And if they're not true, we should not invest. And, and we should tell them why we're not investing. Which I guess leads me to point or lesson number three is we're always honest and radically honest and transparent. One of the things I hated as an entrepreneur is I would meet a VC, I would feel the meeting went well, and then I never hear from them again. I never knew where I stood. I never knew if they were interested or not, if I was ever going to get a term sheet. We tell people where they stand and we turn around quickly. And, and I've realized that that builds a lot of credibility. And I guess the, the next thing I've learned is you don't necessarily need, you know, early on in this uh, podcast, you said, hey, you know, you're just on the one side, maybe you're just a passive investor. And you would think we're a passive investor because we're in so many companies and we're not on the board. But I would argue we're probably some of the most value added investors, entrepreneurs, especially marketplace entrepreneurs have because we actually help them raise money or core value value add for the entrepreneurs is, and we've realized like there are big venture funds out there like Andreessen and they have so many resources 
businesses and head hunters and venture partners that can help you with all these things. We obviously don't have the time, the resources to do that, but we've realized what an entrepreneur is doing is always raising money. Entrepreneurs are raising on a, con on a continuous basis. And, and we, for the most part, not even for the most part, we are not going to be raising or leading the next round. We have no party pre, we don't, we don't have an a priori of like wanting a low valuation. We want them to do well. And so because we've built these relationships with all of these VCs, we will introduce them for their next round to all the top VCs. And it's win, win, win. The VCs love it because they see differentiated deal flow and companies they can invest in. The entrepreneurs love it because it's easy for them to raise money and easier than it would be otherwise. And they they get the meeting. We make the intro to Bessemer and they get the meeting. And we love it because the companies we invested in get funded. And I think we've come to realize what we're good at and what to focus on and not try to boil the ocean from that perspective. And as you look around the landscape today, I think you see a lot of macro commentary about there being a lot of money slot around. So as there's been a, a number of developments in the past cycle, namely valuations creeping up, the existence now of, of money, a lot more money kind of looking at the early stage rounds, you have the platforms like an angel list or a funders club or we fund or all these others. And also this new legislation, which is still getting finalized on opportunity zones. There's a lot going on. Tell me a little bit about just kind of how you see the landscape. Are you worried about all the money chasing the deals? Are you never seen so many awesome deals in your life and it's not a concern? What, what's the lay of the land look like to you? I'm seeing more opportunities than ever before, especially in the early stages. So our returns are pretty exceptional, right? Like 70% realized IRR over like 19 years. So like, I don't know if it's probably top 0.1% VC of all time. While I think we generate alpha, I think the beta and the sector we're at is really good because the fund economics are such that if you're a fund manager and you're good, your economic incentive is to go and raise a bigger fund, right? So all of these people from Excel to Sequoia to whatever have gone from like $400 million funds to like 2 billion funds, 5 billion funds, et cetera. And so they need, because of course, 2% of management fee on 5 billion is 100 million, which is a lot more than 2% management fee on 400 million, which is 8 million. So the economics make, have incentivized managers to raise bigger and bigger funds. And in the later stage, especially because of the introduction of the vision fund, but also frankly, just because everyone has raised bigger funds, there's a lot of value a lot of competition and it is very very late. it has actually pushed me to the other direction as i said we used to do seed now we're doing pre-seed because i feel that at the seed and pre-seed stage there are a few funds and there are a few great funds i mean floodgate or uncorked uh, or slow uh, or Lira Repo or, or the at the pre-seed stage that they're f4 you know there are a few amazing people but for the most part we're competing with the angel investors who don't have VCs that don't have heuristics, don't have deal flow, and don't necessarily know what they're doing. And the opportunities are pretty ripe. And if anything, it's less competitive than it was a, a while back. There were a few years ago where out of YC, it was completely crazy. So Y Combinator, every single deal was like an uncapped node at, at, at crazy valuations, ultimately from a conversion perspective. And that was like 2011, 2012. It has become way less crazy. Valuation, you know, high, but completely unreasonable. So in the early stage, it's not that crazy. Now, YC remains very frothy, but our strategy there is just to wait until the next round and, or do a seed extension. So we're more creative in where we play and, and where the rounds we play at. And, and by the way, by virtue of being nimble, you know, we're quasi a family office masquerading as venture funds, we can, where we can change stage, we can change geography, we can change thesis uh, all the time. We've been able to navigate the, the changing landscape. And so far, you know, I don't have a set number of companies I want to invest in every year. If I meet great entrepreneurs at great deals and great companies, I invest. And if not, I don't. And no obligation to go in one direction or the other. I'm reasonably confident that the companies we're investing are, are amazing. The valuations are, are good. Now, at a macro level, yes, our interest rates are still reasonably low. Is there a lot of capital? Absolutely. The good news is in my category, it seems to be chasing the later stage deals that seem to be very expensive, which is creating a lot of exit opportunities. Now, continuing at the macro level, we're the eighth year of a uh, non-interrupted economic expansion, which is longer, one of the longest expansions ever in history. There are a number of signs, you know, the yield curve is flattening and maybe inverting in, in, in the not too distant futures. There's at the same time, it actually doesn't look like, we could, it doesn't feel like we're at a cycle, right? We're like 3.9% unemployment, inflation remains reasonably tame for the first time in 
10 years, we have aligned growth in every one of the major economies from China to Western Europe to the U.S. On a pure cyclical basis, you don't actually see fundamental recession risk in the next 12 months or, or 24 months. There, that said, there is a black swan risk, which is probably more geopolitical because we have more of these uncertain political actors who can make geopolitical decisions that could lead us to recession and, and or doing weird things like trade wars that should not exist. There is clear geopolitical risk or greater than before. So the risk of a downturn is greater than has been. But barring these types of black swans, I actually remain pretty optimistic. And in our case, I mean, right now, it's a great time to actually have exits. I mean, this year, we already had one IPO, I think over 10 successful exits. We have another company that filed to go public not that long ago. So things are looking really good. I mean, we, we're having one of our best years ever, if not maybe the best year ever. Funny, I, I laugh. There's a, a quote one of my buddies have that he says, you know, so many people in the public markets love saying this is the, the ninth inning. And he says, have you ever been to a baseball game? You know how long the ninth inning lasts? This could be years. <laughs> so that, exactly. That, I love that analogy. We, we got to come up with a phrase for the, what comes before precede uh, coming years. Everyone keeps moving downstream. The, it's, it's maybe just your labs is inventing a new concept and launching it. I'm going to ask you a few more quick questions. I'd love to keep you around today. This has actually been a lot of fun. Put on your economics hat. And I don't know how familiar you are with this new legislation on opportunity zones. If you're not, we can skip it. But if you are, do you think something as a startup founder in, in the US that this is a stimulative type of initiative where they're giving tax breaks for these companies and investments in downtrodden communities? Or is this just going to be abused as a tax shield? Any thoughts on that in general? I don't know the legislation well enough. My intuition is that it won't do anything great necessarily for these, options, for these regions. But that said, that the macro direction or trend is for people, is for more and more places to have great and robust tech ecosystems, right? In, in the late 1990s, if you want to hire like developers, uh, you, you needed to be in Silicon Valley. Like the, there, there was no talent elsewhere. And by the way, my, my first company, I had to spend millions of dollars building servers and building data centers and having Oracle and Microsoft licenses. So now you just use AWS. So the cost of entry has decreased dramatically. The barrier to entry has decreased dramatically. The ability to code is it's way easier to code than it's ever been. You can I can basically build almost anything for like 50K. And frankly, if you can get sweat equity for people, basically for free, you can build almost anything. And that is creating ecosystems that are emerging and very robust in many, many cities. And we're now investors and in startups in like North Carolina and Chicago. And I mean, Chicago maybe is already urban and developed, but like in, in, in many non-traditional centers, Miami, and of course, New New York, Boston, now like Los Angeles with Silicon Beach has really, really emerged. But even in, in Chicago, after Groupon has great companies, I mean, we're investors in a company in Chicago called Reverb. They're a music instrument marketplace. They're doing like over half a billion in sales that used music instruments. I mean, you're, you're seeing these wonderful businesses emerging everywhere. I don't think it's actually driven by legislation. It's really driven by the cost of starting startups has declined dramatically. It's easier to start startups than ever before. And so you have more places where people are emerging and capital is becoming more available though, especially the series A and B, it remains concentrated in the major cities, but that's okay. You're like, if need be, you move your headquarters there. And, and if you really succeed, people will find you. And I don't actually suspect that it's driven by legislation at all. It's also driven by San Francisco deciding to shoot itself in the foot. I mean, they are passing anti-business legislation. They're creating, they're blaming tack on their housing problem, or frankly, it's purely a supply problem, or it's mostly a supply problem. If they moved air rights and you could build up, they wouldn't have this overpricing issue. I mean, between the negative, the anti-business legislations, the idiotic housing legislation, create they're increasing costs to the point where there's an exodus, both of people in the tech world and not tech world. So the combination of those two things, I think, will be a more prevalent driver of the growth of other ecosystems that underlying tax for business legislation. A couple more quick ones, and we'll let you go. We didn't talk about this. We actually don't talk about it much on this podcast, surprisingly. Ben, uh, your involvement, and in, do you see any interesting startups, or do you participate at all in the crypto world, or is that totally scarred by getting your wallet hacked years ago? Didn't get hacked years ago. It got hacked last November. So the thing is, I, we didn't talk about it, what we do as hobbies or whatever, but like, I've been a gamer my entire life. I've always had these powerful GPUs, so 
I started mining for fun in 2011, but I started doing it for you know intellectual masturbation and for fun and to use my GPU in its dance cycle. And as a result, lived through all the bubbles that happened in the space and lived through Mt. Gox where I lost everything. So multiple times on Mygon Max, et cetera. Oh, now between like two-factor authentication and a number of the security measures, I was safe. And of course, lo and behold, I wasn't and I got hacked and people literally got access to everything I had. The thing is, by sheer luck, and and I will immediately admit that it was luck, I had decided that valuations were too frothy and I'd sold everything the week before. So (laughs) literally, you know, millions of crypto that could have been sold, they were not sold. I think at the end of the day, they sold 0.01 BTC out of all the crypto. I've ever had. So I think that was great. So involvement in crypto, I decided to stop direct involvement in crypto once the things became complicated enough. I mean, we're still years away, frankly, from real mass market consumer facing applications. We're still investing in the underlying tools. So FJ has invested in maybe 10 startups in the crypto space, but almost all of them are like infrastructure and groundwork breaking. We decided to not to stop doing our direct investments and instead we've helped build a hedge fund called Lydian, which one of our EIRs is leading. We've basically invested in that instead. So we've we've actually allocated our, our own capital to the hedge fund that we helped build rather than continuing to direct investments because we felt that the expertise both in the trading side and frankly on the startup side was different enough that from a specific focus on marketplaces that I, that it deserved a dedicated fund. We haven't much participated in that world except we reserved the HODL ticker for uh, a public fund. Humorously watching from afar, a lot of these ETF issuers try to do these crypto funds, the SEC saying no dice for a long time. We've been sideline cheerleaders, but don't have any dog in that fight. One of the questions we always ask our guests near the end is, what has been your most memorable investment? And so this can be good, it can be bad, but really it's meant to be the first thing that pops into your head. It's not necessarily an investment because it's more an experience as a startup entrepreneur. When I was running Zingy, I, you know, and I'd missed payroll like so many times, we'd become cash flow positive and April 1 of 2003, but the phone carriers were paying us quarterly plus 45. So I actually didn't even know. And and we, we got on the system, we had to go to database get database extracts of their databases to like get paid. So we didn't even know what we were doing. That's the period during which we'd signed all the carriers. We'd gone from 27 people to seven people. I was like working day and night as everything, project manager, programmer, CEO, essentially janitor. When you stop paying people, you know, they kind of stop showing up for work. So things were like really bad. And finally on August 16 or August 15 of 2003, get checked from friend arrives for like half a million dollars. I think it was like $450,000, And that's when I got it. We, we were saved, like we were cash flow positive. And, and that was like such a relief that we had made it. Like we had covered the chasm and once you're profitable, you're master of your own destiny. And until then, like the, the three years or two and a half years before that had been such a struggle, uh, especially in the post bubble days. And I remember that day much more than like the day I sold my company and made $40 million. You know, the first, the second big company I built uh, or the next company I sold for hundreds of millions or all the ups and downs or, or frankly, even like I was an investor in Baba, right? Like I invested in Alibaba at $4 a share when it was private and I've been writing it all the way since. But none of these has, you know, gut rent or frankly meaningful as the day I like turned it around. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> we, we can pay my $100,000 in credit card. <laughs> I can pay the rent and the employees and we, we, we're, we're going to be around. Like that was probably the most memorable day for me. It's funny, you know, you talk to so many entrepreneurs and this is obviously a little bit survivor bias because the ones that don't make it don't have these stories, but, but even the ones that do make it, how many times right on the ledge, I mean, we definitely had a couple years in the sunken place where tough times and you the story with Elon Musk and t- Tesla being days away from bankruptcy and all sorts of things. This summer, I mean, we had an exit in a Turkish company where I, I probably with the earn out and going to end up making 110 or 120x my investment. The company was a day away from closing shop, a mobile gaming company where we they're doing it like a clash of clans type of game for the emerging markets on Android. And every game, not one of the games they ever made ever worked in that kind of strategy. Like they all failed. They did okay, but nothing great. We were literally closing the company and the team for fun, I'd built a simple casual game called 1010, kind of like 2048 or like, and they put it in like instant, instant mega hit. Company becomes profitable overnight. <laughs> you know, the lesson was, okay, well, maybe instead of trying to make 
make these complex games. Let's focus on these casual games. We, and we seem to be pretty good at making them. And it turned around. We went from being a day away from closing shop, releasing a game we had built in one day. One day, like it was nothing, it had nothing to do with anything we ever did. And then the company, I think last year did like 30 million EBITDA. And like, you know, then it's been success to success to success. And then Zynga bought it for like 250 million cash up front, like uh, in early this summer, like three months ago, four months ago. And that was just, that was like a 75 or 80 X for us. And so you have these stories where things can get really, really close to the edge or to the precipice. And of course, many times you get to the precipice and you fall off the cliff. I mean, you don't actually make it. We've been lucky both in our professional lives as in entrepreneurs and as an investors to make it about 50% of the time, actually, on our investments. We've, we've been buying about 50% of the deals. We laugh here all the time where we talk about how we spend so many hours on building these very serious and well-researched funds, and we're going to launch some stupid thematic cannabis ETF that will probably raise uh, hundreds of billions of dollars and end up being something totally different. But so far, we're trying to stay away from it. So what's been the biggest whiff where you passed on something that's gone on to become... I, I was laughing earlier when you said $100 billion companies because I said, that's almost passe now. We have $2 trillion companies. We're, we're now into yeah. the T's. Memorable whiffs. I was an early investor in Tencent and I sold like dress after the IPO. Tencent is today worth, I don't know, 500 billion. I, I don't even pay attention anymore. It's too depressing. And yeah, I made 50x my money. But at that time, they were just a messenger and I never imagined they could become a Facebook plus Zynga plus WhatsApp plus everything else, right? Like a much more and a payment system and a, and a commerce platform. And, and so that they were just just Q, which was at that time really ICQ. It was pre, it was free, but it really became WeChat. And it's one of the lessons that led me to, okay, instead of selling 100%, maybe I sell 50 or 70% because sometimes trees do grow to the moon, even though it's really, really rare. I had an opportunity to invest in Zynga, which I passed on because I don't, I don't usually do gaming. I, I'm a marketplace guy, and I thought that I didn't like gaming economics more of a studio business. I felt acquisition costs would, would increase, and churn would increase, and development costs would go up, and so I didn't like the business. And, but of course, that was all true. But in the meantime, you could have built a $10 billion business. I passed on the $2 billion rand at Uber, and I passed, and I wrote in my debrief, I'm going to regret this the rest of my life because I love the product, and I love the company, and I love everything. But I I, you know, I made the mistake of looking at the numbers, and I have a hard time justifying $2 billion. And so, you know, when we've been in the business as long as I have, like, you, you have a lot of near wins and near, <laughs> and near misses and companies you could have invested in or companies you could have made money and didn't sell, et cetera. That, and it happens, right? Like my first company that I was running, we had a $300 million cash offer from eBay, and, and I had 40% of the company and wanted to sell it. Would have made $120 million, but my majority shareholder turned me and voted me down. And I didn't, I was 24, I didn't really know anything. And I did have a drag. I didn't even know what a drag was. There's been a lot of near misses. Hopefully, in the next few times, we we don't do near miss, but we actually convert and uh, hit the home run. What is on Fabrice's skiing bucket list for somewhere you haven't skied yet, but love to? Did recently Greenland and Iceland. Right now, in my skiing bucket list, Antarctica, and there's a new heli operator that skis Antarctica. I haven't done the Himalayas. I haven't done Kamchatka. I have not done uh, Caucasus. So all of these are in the to do. I was actually recently invited to go and so OLX is massive in Pakistan and I'm pretty big celebrity there. So I was actually inv invited to go heli ski in Pakistan. So all, all those are on the skiing bucket list for the next decade. Three, I think I still have never been to Silverton outside of Telluride. It's not a crazy mountain, but I've always wanted to go to Taos. It, not not necessarily the best snow, but it seems like a pretty cool location and would love to get down to Portillo or any of those places in Chile. That's also on it. I've not been neither the Argentinian or Chilean ranges, uh, heli ranges, and they're both on the to-do list. Good. Well, we'll have a startup uh, economic summit down there and, and have a conference. The show was actually sponsored last year by Mountain Collective Ski Pass. And so that had two days at about 20 different locations. We'll have to, cool. We need to get them to re-up, Jeff. I, we got to reach out to those guys. Fabrice, where are the best places for people to find you and all of my listeners that are going to send you all of their amazing pitch decks? Where, uh, where, where do people follow you if they want to follow your writings, your ramblings, your investments? Investments and everything else. Easiest probably to go to my blog. Uh, it's just my first name, last name.com. So FabriceGrinda.com. I 
write eh, once every other week or so, but whatever crosses my mind. The entire portfolio of companies is there, uh, our theses, whatever crosses our mind. And I'm also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn and all the usual suspects. It's been a pleasure. If you find yourself in Los Angeles, let us know. We'll hop up to to Mammoth or to Squaw or any of those places. But uh, Fabrice, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Listeners, you can always find the show notes. We'll post links to Fabrice's blog, all sorts of other stuff we mentioned today at mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. If you're loving the show, hating it, leave us a review and check out our new book, The Best Investment Writing, Volume 2. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Good investing.